Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I wanted to talk today about this corpus that we've been building for quite a while now and some of the related resources that we've developed around it. Uh, later today, my colleague, Dr. Obeid, will be talking about some of the deep learning research we've been doing with this data, and he'll get into more of the technology issues. But what I wanted to focus on this morning are just the corpus itself and, and some of the things we, uh, available around the corpus. Um, there have been a large number of people who've contributed to this. The data itself has been collected at uh, Temple University Hospital in uh, collaboration with a number of neurologists at uh, Temple. And uh, we've got uh, fairly nice access to the hospital so that we were able to um, collect data directly from the um, hospital clinic, which is really nice. So let's first talk a little bit about EEGs are manually interpreted today because what our ultimate goal is is to automatically interpret EEGs using machine learning technology. So typically a technician will administer an EEG. Usually when patients come in, they're given a short, relatively short 30-minute EEG. Depending on the outcome of that, they might be admitted to the hospital for a more extended EEG that can often run between uh, one day and three days. So there are these, there are the bulk of the EEGs that we have in the corpus are these 30-minute short EEGs, but we do have a number of examples of the what we call um, LTMs or long-term monitoring EEGs where patients have been admitted for several days and they're continuously being monitored by physicians. The um, Neurologist then reads these EEGs and interprets them. Um, that has to happen so that the hospital can bill for the procedure, which of course is, is very important. And that's really where things get interesting because there's a massive amount of data and neurologists have trouble keeping up with all this data. It's not uncommon to see one of our uh, colleagues who neurologist to, who does this for a living to be reviewing three EEGs three separate patients in real time. They'll set up three monitors and they'll actually be streaming the data in real time. They go through these things very, very fast because they just don't have enough time to go through them in great detail. And they make summary judgments about uh, what occurred, but they don't, they don't really do a de very detailed annotation of the EEGs because they just don't have time to do it. And that's really what we're trying to change. Uh, we'd like to be able to automatically process these EEGs and allow them to focus on events of interest uh, because they they really can't spend uh, a lot of time on these things and and interestingly they do a lot of this after hours so it's a big uh, drag on their lifestyle because they're it's kind of the last thing that they get to after they've seen patients all day at the hospital so it's not a fun thing for them to be doing what comes out of this process is an EEG report that contains their summary findings these reports have a little bit about the patient history a little bit about what they found, what's called the description of the record, and then essentially a diagnosis. And we capture these reports along with the data so that you can do um, natural language queries on the data and, and locate part particular um, sessions of interest. So an important part of the database is not just the raw EEG data, but also giving you access to these EEG reports. And once the report is coded and signed off on, the patient can be billed, and that keeps the hospital happy. Now, needless to say, if you're, when you talk about open source release of data, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in shortly, uh, you have to de-identify all of this stuff. The report uh, contains patient information that uh, is protected by HIPAA and things like that. The EEG files actually have some patient information in them as well. So in addition to de-identifying the EEG data, which is stored in an EDF format, we have to manually de-identify these reports, and that's a pretty labor-intensive process. So we have a team of students who go through these reports and manually uh, clean them up. We also do use some automated tools to um, help that, with that process. But uh, in the end, these reports have to be manually reviewed by our um, student workers before they can be released. So once we release the data, any kind of information that could ident potentially identify a patient has been removed. And that's one of the unique things about this project, I would say, is that Temple Hospital's been gracious enough to allow us to actually uh, process their data and release it in, as open source data. 
And as I'll talk about later in this talk, very few institutions today are willing to do that, even in this day and age of open data resources. And that's, to be honest, quite depressing, but uh, for that's one of the things that makes our project rather unique is that we are able to uh, release actual clinical data as open source data. Now, the flip side of this is the automatic interpretation process where we essentially are trying to replace uh, manual interpretation of the um, EEG with some kind of automated system based on deep learning that can identify events. And that's on the surface something that seems easy enough to do, but of course these systems have to be trained and that's really where the things get complicated because you have to find ways to annotate the data in a cost-effective way so that you can generate large amounts of data for the deep learning systems. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly, but we do have a significant chunk of the data that's annotated, but we're not manually annotating all of the data because that would be prohibitive in terms of cost. But we do have the reports for every EEG signal or each session. So from the reports, we can do a lot of sort of lightly supervised or unsupervised deep learning type stuff. And from the data that we've manually annotated, we can do more specific supervised learning type things with, with our deep learning systems. So we're using a variety of machine learning algorithms to do this. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Obeid will talk about the details of this a little bit later. But this does require truth mark data, both for training and for evaluation. And I'll talk uh, in a few minutes about some of the resources we have to do that. Uh, it took us a while to decide how the data should be labeled because the it was a process that was foreign to the neurologists, and they don't really describe their work in, the, in terms that are useful for machine learning people. So we had to basically work with them to kind of interface to a point where we could both mutually agree on um, how the data should be annotated. And, and, uh, and we actually have a team of undergraduates that does this annotation, which is an interesting part of this project. The EEG reports themselves uh, look something like this, as I'm, and um, most of these reports for, for maybe the last uh, 12 to 15 years have this kind of a format. But interestingly, over the years, these reports have changed in structure. And that's one of the things that makes this a little bit difficult is that the, there's not a fixed format that they're using for these reports. So usually um, the process, they actually generate what's called a preliminary report, which has a summary diagnostic, uh, diagnosis, and that's done in a spreadsheet. We don't really find those to be very useful, so we haven't really been collecting those in recent years. But the final report is what we do we do capture and de-identify. And the most important part of this is probably this clinical impression and the clinical correlation where we sort of where they sort of make their summary diagnosis. But one of the challenges in this process is that over the 17 years or so that we have reports, the format of these reports has changed many, many times. So we release the data as flat text files, essentially. We don't try to parse it or organize it or, or database it in terms of the corpus that we release because there's just a lot of variation from report to report in how this is done. Sometimes physicians will have their own style. Sometimes over time, the reporting tools they use will change styles and things like that. Um, another thing that makes this kind of interesting and, and challenging is that over the years, there have been a number of different databases that have, or reporting systems that have been used to store the information. Uh, we're currently working with a system called EPIC, which if you're, if you're in a clinical setting, you're, you might be familiar with that. It's one of the leading hospital software packages. And that's actually turning out to be quite nice because the, that forces the, the neurologist to input the text in a structured format. But over the years, they've used different uh, databasing schemes, and we spent a lot of time trying to access those and reverse engineer them while maintaining patient privacy and those kinds of things. And fortunately, our, we have student workers who sit at the hospital and can actually access all of this information through the hospital IT systems, which is rather, I would say, rather unique. You don't find a lot of university research groups that are allowed to actually access hospital record systems and things. But we've worked through all those processes, and we can access the reports in EPIC and download them and things like that. So. In the past few years, now that they're using EPIC, things have gotten pretty nice in terms of being able to match reports against the data. In the earlier years, we actually had to scan 
PD, scan hard copy reports and OCR them and all that. It was a real mess. But we're pretty much beyond that now, and that's a good good thing. So the quality reports that we're getting are much better in the, in the past um, three or four years of doing this. But we do have reports going back since about 2002 now. So the corpus itself is rather large, and it continues to grow. We have some summary statistics here. Uh, we're currently at about, I think, about 35,000 sessions. Patients will typically have an average of about 1.7 sessions. So uh, we have about 22,000 patients represented in the database. We have some patients that have a large number of sessions. We are we have a patient who's had 42 um, EEGs done. That's our most frequently occurring uh, patient. But as I mentioned, the average is typically about 1.75 sessions. So you get about uh, two sessions per patient. So with the patients that have more sessions available, you can actually do some longitudinal studies. Uh, but most of the patients, the single largest chunk of the database are patients who come in for these short 30-minute um, EEGs, and then you don't see them again. The ages range from about 16 years old to about 90-plus years old. Um, we do have some very young patients, but Temple Hospital typically deals with um, adults or teenage-aged uh, patients. We're not seeing a lot of children at Temple since there's other hospitals in the region that focus on that. Uh, the sampling rates vary from 250 hertz to as high as 1,000 hertz. Most of the data falls in the range of either 250, 256, or 512 hertz. That's a little bit annoying because you have to resample the data. So we typically, for our research experiments, we resample everything to 250 hertz. There doesn't seem to be much benefit to going up higher in frequency. And on occasion, we've released resampled versions of the data to people. But... Um, the process of resampling the data is not that difficult with a lot of the tools that exist out there today. Um, the data is stored in um, EDF files. You heard a little bit about those earlier today. That's a fairly common um, format for the data. But one of the things that makes the data very challenging is that the number of channels varies from session to session depending on the type of EEG that was ordered. Um, there's actually, in this graphic, we're showing the number of channels there's a, anywhere from a minimum of about 28 channels to a maximum of about 129 channels. And fortunately, about 90% of the data can be mapped onto a standard 1020 configuration for, e, for an EEG, which is sort of a, a very popular clinical configuration that's been used for a number of years. However, when you write software to deal with the data in EDF files, you have to pay attention to the channel labels because the data you can't simply assume that the data always appears in the same order. This is a very, very common mistake that a lot of our users make. Um, we've written software that reads the data, looks at the channel labels, and decodes things based on the channel labels. And you pretty much have to do that if you want to process this data. And we, we advise people how to do that. But some people try to just process the data as it's written in the order in which it's written to the file, and that's a mistake because the channel, the, the index of the channel varies depending on the type of EEG and the label. In fact, there's, over, there's about 250 unique labels that are used. That's another problem that we face is the, there's about four or five different types of EEGs contained in the database, and uh, we can point you to documentation which describes that, those in more detail but the channel labels are inconsistent. In fact, channel labels are inconsistent across the industry, which is a real problem. There's been talk about trying to standardize those, but they haven't really gotten very far on that. So when you move from hospital to hospital, unfortunately, the labels that they use to describe the channels in the EEG may actually vary. And that's another one of these sort of nasty little database issues that you have to deal with is that uh, there's a lack of standardization on channel labels. So all of our software has a front-end component to it that maps, that allows you to specify which channels you want to process, what the labels are for those, and it, permute, it uh, identifies those in the file and brings out the data so it's in the uh, right format for you so that you can easily apply it to your machine learning systems. We have a little bit of information here, the, the, uh, the nature of the data. The corpus grows at about a rate of about 3,000 EEGs per year. 
Um, as I mentioned, most of the EEGs are in the 20 to 30 minute range, but we have a number of EEGs that are much longer than that. I think the longest that we have are about 36 hours worth of data. In the EDF files, you have a header, and this, show, this uh, table here shows some of the information that's available in the header. You can get information about the date and such, the patient ID. We anonymize patient IDs and things like that so that uh, you cannot identify patients. However, we do keep a table that allows us to map back to the original data. That information is held at the hospital in, in a very secure environment. So if we need to go back to the actual patient for EEG, we can do that by mapping of these patient IDs. There's some other information here about the uh, EDF files have information about the conditions that were used to collect the data, max and mins of channels and all those kinds of things. And we have software that we provide people that can decode that if, not, if they're interested in it. The data has been carefully de-identified. And the other thing that's important to note about this data, these, the EDF files are actually what are called pruned EEGs. So when the, the data is collected, a technician will identify segments of the data that are of interest to the uh, neurologist. And when we generate the EDF files from the raw data, the data that's generated represent these segments that have been identified. So they're not contiguous EEG recordings, unfortunately, because those would be a lot of data. Uh, those can get into the gigabyte range per, ED, per um, EEG. But they are what are called pruned EEGs, which is what the neurologists look at when they uh, actually read these things. So essentially, we have the signal broken up into segments. It's not uncommon to have six or seven of these segments, but these segments contain the meaningful information in the EEG. The, what's being thrown away is essentially background data where there was really nothing of interest happening. So um, these are not contiguous recordings, but pruned EEGs, as they're called. Uh, we also manually annotate the data. We have a Python-based visualization and annotation tool that we um, use for this, which we, we also distribute. That tool has a number of nice functions. You can look at uh, channels of the signal. You can do filtering, all the kinds of things you've heard about other people talk about, um, tools such as m and &E and EEG labs and that kind of thing. Uh, we have spectrogram capabilities and that kind of thing. We also allow, though, annotation of individual channels or segments as a whole. And that really forms the basis for the way we annotate our seizure data. This tool also integrates a cohort retrieval system where you can actually do natural language queries on the data. You can say, you know, give me all the patients with GPEDs and things like that. And a query is done that, that looks at both the medical records and the events that we've found in the signal and can get, bring you back a list of VEG signals that satisfy these queries. So we're actually able to query both the unstructured text reports and the signal data and provide an interface, a natural language interface, where you can query both of those simultaneously. It's been something we developed in collaboration with our colleagues at University of Texas at Dallas. And it's part of what's called a cohort retrieval system. So you can do things like show me other EEG signals that are like this one I'm looking at. And um, there's a nice little query interface built to this where you can you can either fill out forms or you can do natural language queries, and it'll bring back for you a list of EEGs that are, match your search criteria. This uses a deep learning-based system that identifies events in the EEG signals. Dr. Obeid will talk a little bit about that later. It also uses a natural language processing system that analyzes the EEG reports and parses them, looks for concepts relates those concepts in, in graphs and allows you to do uh, a fair amount of um, um, interpretation of the reports based on that information. And we can point you to publications on this um, if you're interested in learning more about this. Now, the main thing I wanted to talk about today are the resources that we've built around this. So we have the basic corpus, which is currently uh, version 1.1.0. We're about to release um, a new version, which will include all of the data through um, 2016. And hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll release everything through 2019. Around this data, we have built subsets that are of interest to people. Perhaps the most significant of these is the seizure corpus, where we have manually annotated over um, 6,000 signals, EDF files now for seizure events. And this allows uh, you to do 
to develop machine learning technology that can do automatic seizure detection. And that's something we've been working on for a while. This data has been very carefully annotated by a group of um, undergraduates who've been trained to do this, and it's been validated against uh, neurologists, and uh, we've been shown that our uh, student annotators are very, very accurate. In fact, in some cases, they're more accurate than the neurologists because they're doing very detailed annotations. And this data is publicly available, like all of our data, and it's actually going to be used in a Kaggle-style challenge that we've been working on um, with IBM. Um, there are other offshoots of this data. We have a significant amount of data marked in terms of whether it's an abnormal or normal EEG, so you can do automatic detection of abnormal EEGs. Um, we have an artifact database that, uh, where we've transcribed some artifacts that appear as, as background signals, things like muscle movements and chewing and slowing and that kind of thing. And um, that allows you to build more complex background models that can um, recognize some of these events. Um, we have a segment of the data Base that we worked with um, NIH on where we've identified 100 patients with confirmed history of epilepsy and 100 normal patients. So if you want to do some kind of epilepsy detection, you can begin to look at that data. And then we have a, um, we have a small what's called events corpus that where the data has been um, labeled for things like spike and sharp waves, PLEDs, GPEDs, that kind of thing. All of these databases are linked back to the original TUH corpus, so you can actually look at different, you look at a patient across all these different databases, and, and that makes it really interesting because you can correlate certain activities for patients across all these different classifications. Um, in addition to that, we distribute software that to support the data, and one of the things that we've been distributing recently are is a standardized scoring package if you're doing something like automatic seizure detection. Um, there's a lot of ways you can score your algorithm, and we've produced a standardized scoring package, published several papers on this that uh, we hope people will adopt because it provides you a common framework from which to score your experiments. And that's important when you're trying to compare results. Standardized scoring is something that's really been lacking in the bioengineering community, so we're trying to bring some discipline to that through this scoring package. Where we're at today, we've been distributing, this, this project began in 2012, we've been distributing data now for several years. We have over 2,000 users that have subscribed to these resources, so there's a pretty large community now uh, looking at this data and trying to um, do research on it. We hope that by the end of, by, through the summer of 2019, we'll release um, most of the data that we have in hand. We've been releasing version one had data through 2015, version 1.2, which we should release by the end of the summer. We'll have data through 2016, and then hopefully shortly after that, we'll release everything through the middle of 2019. So we try to basically, we, we're, we had to play catch up initially, but we're trying to release uh, each year's data within about six months after the close of that year. If you want to sign up for this corpus, you can go to the URL provided, it will ask you to register. This is a completely automated process, and we just ask for your name and institution so that we can track this information for our sponsors. And then we, uh, it sends, it emails you a username and password, and then you have access, direct access to the resources. So the last thing I wanted to say about all of this is this specific point that even after all these years, it's really amazing how few truly open source resources there are. We've been trying to get data from a lot of different people, and invariably these discussions get bogged down with issues like we have to add you to our IRB, or we have to make you sign a data sharing agreement with our institution, blah, 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 blah. Um, this data is out there. It's open source. You can download it from these URLs in a completely um, automated way. We also because of the volume of data, it's impractical to actually download the whole database from the web. So we also provide people a service where if they send us a disk drive, we'll copy the data to the disk drive and send it back to them. All those instructions are available at the URL I'm showing. And uh, we also provide a lot of support for people to helping them try to uh, learn how to process the data and, and write software and things like that. We try to be help as helpful as possible on that. So this is a very large uh, open source resource. 
And uh, it's all clinical data. It's very real, very difficult, very challenging. Um, Dr. Obey later today will talk about how difficult it is to do high performance classification of this data. That's a whole nother issue, but um, hopefully you'll find this data to be useful. So I think time's up because my Q&A window popped up. So at this point, um, I think we'll, we're gonna hold questions until the open session, the open Q&A part of this session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.